Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host and meteorologist DT from Weather Risk, the captain of chaos, the colonel of confusion, the commander of catastrophe. Let's talk about This Week in Weather as of October 8th. A lot to talk about here. First, we'll start up with a drought map in case you haven't missed it. And this is important because of a major early season snowstorm coming for the Rockies and the Plain States. Uh, most of the Rockies, I should say. And then uh, significant rain for the upper plains. And uh, given the drought conditions there, this is a big deal. Now, one of the reasons why the drought has worsened here in the plains, Oklahoma, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa, into Arkansas, northern Texas, is because the MJO has been stuck in phase three. Um, for much of September, which is a very dry pattern here. So the drought has really expanded from the Rockies and the Great Basin. We all know how bad it is in California and Nevada and Utah and the eastern portions of Washington, Oregon and Idaho, Montana. But it really has expanded eastward in the past month. And on top of that, it's been warm. Uh, so which has made pulled out a lot of moisture out of the ground as well. It's been great for harvest, but not good for soil moisture. And you can see the soil moisture anomalies here. Look at this, October 6th, the eastern U.S. generally wetter than normal from Louisiana to Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. Meanwhile, uh, Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, the Dakotas, Kansas, the drought, the anomalies here are quite strong. So it's either been feast or famine here. You know, eastern, eastern third of the U.S. quite wet, plains, the western United States quite dry. Now that's changing to some degree. Look at the upper air map here. This is October 6th. We had this big upper low in, we, uh, in, in the deep south of Delta, produced a lot of rain. Uh, decent in the eastern United States portion of the eastern United States. We have a big block here in uh, central Manitoba, um, Ontario, and then the trough on the west coast. Rainfall, that map has produced this kind of rainfall pattern for the past week. You can clearly see the big rains, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky. The yellows is four inch rains, the reds are five, six, seven inch rains, a lot of rain there. But even one to two inch rains, one to three inch rains in eastern, southern Missouri, Illinois, Indiana. Notice not a lot in, uh, in North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania. And of course, nothing in Iowa, almost nothing in Minnesota, the Dakotas, Nebraska, where the drought is expanding. Temperatures, well, in this quarter pattern, not surprisingly, it's been warm. And remember, in October, the normal max and min temperatures drop one degree every two days. So, you know, if you have a temperature of 78, 80 degrees in, you know, September 15th, that's a little on the warm side, but it's not a big deal. But if you have that in October 8th, that's much, much warmer. So relative to normal. It looks a lot La Nina. Here you go. There it is. Uh, the, the map, you can clearly see La Nina developing along the equatorial Pacific from off the coast of South America out towards the date line. Uh, very clearly, very pronounced. And if you look at the data, uh, you know, the Australians and the CPC, these are different regions. Uh, 1.2 and then 3, 3.4, and 4. If you don't know, um, 1.2 is off the coast of South America, Peru, and th region 3 and 4, three, that's in the middle, and then region 4, which is out to the west. So you can clearly see that the coldest waters, you look at these numbers relative to normal, is in region 4. That's where the water relative to normal is colder than any other region. Now, generally, I like using the Australian data more than the CPC. Uh, it's updated more frequently. It's more accurate. All right, if we look at the subsurface readings here, as of September, I should say, it should say October, oh, what are you going to do? But as of October 6th, you can see the cold water, minus 1 to minus 2 degrees centigrade below normal here. Uh, very classic La Nina signature. Nothing extreme, but no, classic La Nina. We look at our different projections here. Here's the European model. Uh, I like this, using this one a lot. You can clearly see the black line was the September mean. The solid red line is the October mean. And it hasn't really changed much. It's got a little colder. But if you uh, you can clearly see that, you know, if you look at the background here, you can see the light blue background. That is the beginning of La Nina. Minus 0 0.5 degrees centigrade or colder is La Nina. And both of the September and October mean, they deepen it to around, you know, minus 0 0.7. And then it weakens in G after December, reaches its peak November, December, then weakens it January, February, and March. So never gets moderate, clearly keeps it weak La Nina. If you look at the different seven climate models, you can see, again, some differences. But mostly the problem is the American climate model, NOAA, the CFS. So on the we have November, we have December. We have 
seven climate models. Um, you can clearly see that uh, the Australians on the top, uh, BOM, the Canadian, European, JMA, that's Japanese, Meteo France, NOAA, the CFS, and the UCMAT. Notice here in November, December, that the NOAA model, the CFS, is much colder than any of the other models. And that causes a distortion of the mean. Look at the mean here at the bottom. See the black, the dark brown, uh, dark black bar there? Uh, that is the mean. And if you if the NOAA model was closer to the other ones, um, then you would have a vastly different mean. So the NOAA model is pulling the mean off a little bit here. Uh, it's much, much colder. And that continues in uh, January and February. Again, much colder than any other other models. So um, that's a problem. So a lot of people, you know, if they use the CFS, they're going to be seeing, you know, moderate uh, La Nina, and it may not be. So their forecast is going to be off. Now, the other thing to talk about here is the type of El Nino. So this is a nice image here. Um, the image on the, both maps on the left, let's look at the left side, both those uh, images on the left. That is the typical, what we call Eastern Pacific classic ENSO. ENSO means El Nino and La Nina, refers to both, okay? And it typically, whether it's warm or cold, whether it's El Nino or La Nina, it forms off the coast of Peru and it expands along the equator out towards the date line. It starts in region 1.2 and it moves out towards region four. Now, on the right-hand side, there's a special type of ENSO event known as a Modokai. And the Modokai El Nino is different because in this case, the, the strongest warm water or the strongest cold water is in the region four in the central Pacific along the equator, not off the coast of Peru. And that makes a big difference to the uh, weather patterns and the climate are the seasonal weather patterns, especially during the winter months. Now, why is this important? Well, this here is a picture, an image of the 10 different climate models. And they are all showing, notice the dark blue, that's cold water, along the equatorial Pacific, not off the coast of South America, but in the central Pacific. So the top five climate models, uh, we start off with the European um, mean, that's the upper one, the top row, way over to the left. Then you have the European consensus. Then you have the uh, CFS, the uh, NOAA climate model. Then you have the um, German model and the Canadian model. The bottom row, we have the British model, Medio France is the French model, the Japanese model, the European, and the super ensemble. And all of them are showing uh, La Nina, uh, weak to moderate, um, centered in the Pacific Ocean, in the equatorial Pacific, not off the coast of Peru. And now uh, that is known as, you know, Eastern Pacific or Central Pacific. So this graph here shows us various different uh, types of ENSO events or neutral conditions since 1980. Now there is additional information when I update or I'll have this graph updated uh, later on this chart, but this is since 1980. So on the left hand side, you can see there's ENSO right there, all right, all the way through since 1980 neutral conditions neither el nino or la nina now eastern pacific means off the coast of peru the classic el nino and again remember the super humongous 1982-83 uh, record el nino and then we had the uh, super humongous one 2015-16 both of those classic events off the coast of peru that built out on the equator you know towards the date line then you have central pacific el nino in the middle here and that's different and remember the super great winter of 2009 2010 and the great winter of 1990 of 2002 2003 they were both in the central pacific and they were great winters on the east coast even though they were el ninos and pretty strong ones so now we have eastern pacific the two columns on the right hand side el, uh, la nina and the central pacific la nina you can see that and again uh, just to show you the difference um on the right hand side where it says Central Pacific, Modokai, that's Modokai, Central Pacific, CP. Look at the bottom, 2016-17. That was a pretty good winter. And so was 2010-2011. They were decent winters. And they had uh, La Nina, they were weak, and we had good snows, good decent winters in the Midwest, the East Coast. But if you look at 2017-2018, La Nina, and last winter, 2020-2021, they were in the Eastern Pacific off the coast of Peru. 
and they were shitty winters. So there you go. And we can see the difference here. Let me show you what it looks like. This is moderate or strong La Nina, the overall pattern. And you can see this is not a good pattern if you like cold and winter weather for the Midwest or the East Coast, especially the Eastern United States. For one thing, the yellow, the red there shows the positive anomaly is in the Eastern Pacific, which means your trough is in the Rockies. And you end up getting a flat ridge over the Southeastern United States. So this is a good pattern for the Midwest of Great Lakes and the Plain States, but it's not for the East Coast. And the blocking, the positive anomaly is in Iceland. In North Atlantic, this is not a Greenland block. So it's not a good pattern here. And that's what happens with a moderate or strong La Nina. Now this is um, La Nina. Um, this is when you have uh, La Nina uh, um, when it's weak. And it's, this is different. When you have a weak La Nina, you end up getting some blocking here in northeastern Canada and uh, in northwest Atlantic, a little bit of Greenland. And, the, uh, uh, and you don't have the flat ridge over the southeastern United States. So this is not terrible. It's not ideal, but it's not terrible. The trough is still in the Rockies, uh, the west coast here, and the anomaly, the positive anomalies in the central Pacific. So it's not terrible for the eastern United States. Not great. Uh, but it's not terrible. And that, so, depending on other factors, you can, with a weak La Nina, get a decent winter out of it. Now, slide 18 is different. Here, when, the we, when you have a weak El Nino or a La Nina, but it's in the central Pacific, not off the coast of Peru, that's off the coast of Peru, this is weak in the central Pacific. Now you have a totally different pattern. Look at the very, very strong blockage signature in Greenland and uh, uh, Baffin Island and the Arctic regions. Negative Arctic oscillation, negative NAO. The mean trough is on the east coast. This is a this is a snowstorm pattern. That's what this is. This is an active winter pattern. So you know, there you go. That's what that would favor. So that's why this is important because if that is correct and it stays weak. We, that's the kind of pattern we're looking at potentially for the winter. So yeah, I'm a little excited, quite frankly. I gotta tell you. All right, let's move on to more uh, operational stuff. Here's the MGO phase five, which is a, a, a dry pattern for the Midwest. You can see. Notice, look at September down here. You see phase three. Look how long it lingered. The MGO in phase three, which is so dry in the Midwest. Um, even in the Midwest, the Plain States. Again, the, one of the reasons the drought has expanded. Look at phase five in October. Very dry in the Midwest and the. Uh, uh, Ohio Valley, Plain States. Phase six, you're getting some moisture coming back here a little bit as well. Now, the temperatures, uh, it hasn't been that cool on the East Coast. It definitely has been warm relative to the normal the Rockies, the Plain States. And that will continue in phase five and phase six. Going beyond here, look at the projections. This here is the GFS on the left, the European on the right. They move it into phase six briefly, and then it goes into neutral circle. See the green line here on the left-hand side? And then you can see the line here on the European in neutral circle by October 20th, October 15th and 20th. And then beyond that, the extended projections for the European extended uh, brings into phase eight and one by the end of the month. And so does the Australians at the last week of October, beginning of November, eight and one. You can see that that's a major shift in the pattern. Why is that a major shift? Well, let's look at it. Here, this is phase eight in La Nina in October. And you can see there's a big old trough on the west coast, the Pacific Northwest, very stormy pattern. A lot of rain, a lot of snow for the Rockies, for the west coast. They need it badly. They need it. And a big ridge in eastern Canada and the east coast. That's a warm pattern for the eastern United States. Not great. Okay. But look what happens when it goes into phase one. Totally different pattern. A bit of a ridge on the west coast, a big mean trough over the Midwest and the Great Lakes, much colder pattern on the East Coast, blocking in central Canada. That's a totally different pattern. That's the beginning of real autumn. When it goes into phase one in October, that's the beginning of, of uh, late, last week of October. That's the beginning of real autumn. All right, that was the upper air map from October yesterday, uh, October 8th. Nothing was going on here. And then you can see uh, what's going on in the next couple of days here. First, on this map, let me blow it up here We can so I can bring this forward here. So you can see uh, we have the block in eastern Canada. We have the upper low off of Florida, another one in New Mexico. So that's ejecting a low pressure, which is going to bring some rain to the plains and the upper Midwest. And then this monster trough dropping another big piece of energy coming in for next week. That's going to produce the rocky snowstorm. And then this image, we blow this one up here. There you go. 
and you can see this becomes a gigantic upper low in Arizona, New Mexico, huge rocky snowstorms. Okay, we have another upper low in the Gulf of Alaska and another one in the Northwest Atlantic. So we have three of them, and there's a big block in eastern Canada and Greenland. And if we look at the actual uh, conditions here, now this was the European model from yesterday. It had the low along the coast, significant rain, Georgia pushing up into Virginia and Maryland. Uh, that's what the European model is showing yesterday. And then the new, the 12Z run on Friday had that low further off the coast, so not as much rain. Um, so, you know, and, and the rainfall maps reflect that. This was the European model from early Friday morning. It had rain getting into central Virginia, a lot of rain in the Carolinas, and then the afternoon run uh, kind of took it away, the GFS, you can see that. Um, a lot of rain in North Carolina as well, uh, but again, nothing north of that. Uh, rain kind of pulled away. And here is the GFS. Now, taking the low off the coast on uh, Sunday, now Monday, and there's our next system. There's the one for coming out of uh, New Mexico, the first one, moderate rain to the dry areas of Missouri and uh, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, that sort of thing. Now here's our rocky snowstorm. There it is. What a bomb. A big rocky snow. There's the big low coming out of Arizona through Colorado, then heading up towards Nebraska and then to Minnesota. Now, if this was November 12th and 13th, this would be all snow, even for the Dakotas and Minnesota, but it's not. So this is a rocky snowstorm. You can clearly see it. it's going to be a big deal. They really read the need of snow cover. Here's the European yesterday's after 12Z run monster snow. Again, all mostly you know above 2,000 feet, but still, this is a big deal. They need this snow cover badly, so this is a big deal for those guys. And I'm really hoping they get pounded like this. And there's the GFS, very very strong agreement between the two of them. You can clearly see that. In terms of the total moisture, look at this. And the again, just focusing on the Midwest, the Plain states here a little bit. A lot of this is snow in the Rockies, but still, you know, you look at the brown color, that's five, six inch rains, uh, total liquid equivalent. So you're getting a lot of precip into the drought areas here. This is big news. This is really going to help things quite a bit in those areas. So I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, verify. All right, uh, October 15th, the upper air pattern, you can see the block is still there. The mean trough is still there, extending in these monster pieces of energy coming in. Uh, uh, from the Gulf of Alaska into the Midwest. Eventually, they're going to pass underneath the block. The trough is going to go underneath it in this direction, and that'll allow for the pattern change to take place. But that's still way going to take a while. Uh, this year is uh, October 22nd. Now we have some sort of disturbance here in the Tennessee Valley. So the block in Canada, okay, and still the trough in the Gulf of Alaska, I'm sending in these big pieces of energy. Uh, so it's still a mild pattern, but there's going to be some sort of storm here in the Ohio Valley, Mid-Atlantic, October 22nd, 23rd, 24. Look at the temperature anomalies. Oh my God, is it warm for the Midwest and the Plain States, relative to normal. You know, that's a lot. That's Fahrenheit, but still, you know, that's a pretty warm readings. Now beyond that, again, once we get into phase eight and phase one, the pattern begins to change here, and we can see the change occurring. The European weekly models. This is November 3rd. The block gets very strong, builds up into Greenland. Again, uh, a big anomaly here in the Midwest, the Mississippi Valley. That's November 3rd. Another one November 8th and 9th that moves to the Midwest, Midwest and then the East Coast. Uh, we're getting a bigger ridge on the West Coast. This is a much colder pattern uh, by mid-November, if this is correct. So uh, that would be nice to see here. And if we look um, uh, beyond that, uh, it, you know, the week two rainfall anomalies you can see the midwest here getting some more rain in the Ohio valley uh with these uh, systems coming in here uh but like i said i think the pattern is going to begin to change late october beginning november and uh, you know we'll see if that actually happens or not anyway that's the uh discussion that's this week in weather hopefully you enjoyed it this is meteorologist dt from weather risk i'll see you over on the uh, twitter page and on the facebook page